Hello? Hey, uh, yes, I, I'm in uh, Louisiana. <laughs> I'm just about to leave Louisiana. Uh, I want to apologize for that strange message I, uh, I left you um, <laughs> earlier in the day. I know it didn't really make any sense. It was very vague. Um, I have a moment now before I move on and, and leave the state um, to fill you in on what I was talking about. Um, this, this, this town is called Minden, Louisiana. I, I was literally just um, passing through on my way to someplace else. And uh, I was invited. Uh, I have a long-standing invitation with an old uh, college classmate to swing by. He works in a horticultural research center uh, here in Minden. It was just the strangest experience. I, I, I He invited me to come to see what he did for a living. And... Um, He's a botanist, very high level. So at one point, um, he he took me into a, a very big room at the research center. And the room is uh, basically entirely dirt. The floor is just entirely dirt. And they're, they're cultivating a certain kind of plant that was discovered in, in, in South America about five years ago. And he said, well, I want to show you something uh, interesting. He had me take off my shoes barefoot and he just had me walk out onto this huge dirt area the soil very rich soil and i saw plants there and, and and so forth and he said well just just stand here just stand here for a while this room was 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 filled it was bathed in this uh this blue light and he said what he was going to do is when he when he shut this blue light off something was going to happen he said don't worry about it just stand here and let it happen so off this blue light went, and now I'm, I'm just standing in this soil, some, some foliage sort of in, in, in the soil. And after about three minutes, the leaves of, a, of some nearby plants began to sort of stretch towards me. And um, I heard my friend over the, the PA system say, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Just let it happen. And over the course of about six or seven minutes, the tendrils of this plant reached little by little inching over the soil to my left ankle and slowly began to wrap around my ankle it's very fast in a very aggressive way and 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 the uh the plant's tendrils began to cinch very very tightly around my ankle until i, I finally said uh you know kid this is actually getting very uncomfortable and uh, I looked down, and, and uh, the blue light went back on. Apparently, the blue light um, is kind of a, a, uh, a doping effect on these plants. My friend came back out, and uh, before he actually got to me and I put my shoes back on, I saw that one of these plants that had gotten a hold of me had actually pulled itself out of the soil about six feet away. And had pulled itself all the way over to me. It was literally crawling on its own to get to me. And I, I just, you know, he he explained uh, a lot about this plant to me, and, and it was exhibiting some very rare characteristics. And I just, I, I know I had to leave you a message about this. And um, you know, I'm I'm leaving now in Minden, Louisiana, and um, they brought back some things in my memory from my childhood, childhood, which unsettled me. But yeah, I just wanted to tell you the story that uh, it's kind of an interesting, extraordinary anecdote that things I never thought existed in this world. Uh, it, was, it was a very, very strange day. That is remarkable. You know, you left this very cryptic message uh that you had had this strange plant experience. And that was basically all you gave me. But this, this set me searching because I've had some ideas lately that I, I've been needing a push to kind of cement. Uh, and th this sent me searching. I think where it started was this idea of poison 
And I think I, I was reading a, a book recently, an autobiography. This woman was writing about her great-grandfather, who she discovered was a poisoner. You know, kind of, kind of wrestling with this, this strange legacy and the particular ideas attached to poison. And so it led me to thinking about defense mechanisms and how they're, they're kind of similar, or the terms are similar at least, between you know, plants and animals and humans. You know, the things that might come to mind when you think of a defense mechanism, like camouflage, you know, or, or uh, frightening sounds, spikes, claws, and of course, poison. One of the most kind of interesting and important dimensions of these mechanisms is the idea of a predator-prey relationship which is hugely important in the balance of things, right? Because there has to be this um, balance between, say, the prey's adapted defenses and the predator's evolving skill at, oh, circumnavigating or breaching these established defenses. And with, with that in mind, I've been then thinking about you know, plants and humans and the kind of predator-prey relationship that they have. One of the most common defenses of plants is, of course, poison, which can usually present to predators um, or humans uh, as, you know, a bitter taste. Uh, this is one of the warning signs but with us being what we are, um, some psychoanalytic theory tells us of our death drive, if you will, or death urge. It's been suggested that our, our strongest instinct is actually not to self-preserve, but to self-destruct. And so I think that our fairly recent and constantly evolving embrace of this poison signifier in plants is interesting. Uh, you know, bitter flavors balance out other flavors like sweetness and fat. You know, it's something we've come to really enjoy. And I think of it as this is harnessing the death urge in this kind of survivable way. The taste buds at the back of our mouths, uh, it's an area where we taste bitter flavors most effectively. And it's because this might be our evolution of a last chance trigger before we swallow the poison. So... It gives us this one last chance to, you know, eject it or spit it out before we swallow it. It was a bright mailbox day, a post office day, full of rota heads, of bone white envelopes, of newsprint coupons staining the hands. But she skipped her dinner. She couldn't eat. She was too emptied or too full. But it wasn't even that exactly. She was just that kind of delirious happy that makes a fool of you. Because there was something she was trying to forget today. She had been receiving strange and threatening letters for several weeks. When night fell, she waited a bit for the air to cool, to sink. Then she took her heaviest flashlight and set out over the rugged lawn behind the house. As the grass got taller, she could hear it tap and zip across the knees of her jeans. Zip, zip, just like that, the first letter had said. You steal the goddess from her soil and the trees of her home. Have you ever wanted something and then just left it alone? A great teacher said, it's easy to harvest plants. 
The hard part is not harvesting. She entered the copse of trees carefully, as she knew there were deltas of spiderweb strung through the branches, waiting for her hair, for her shoulders and mouth. Up ahead, glowing white and pearly in the dark, it was there. She had come upon it one day when she was upset, and the day was leaking, draining, and wasn't sure if what she was seeing was real. It was beautiful, haunting. It looked like a torn Kleenex in breeze, the bell of its head bent as if ashamed toward the earth. Since then, she'd been pulling it, cutting it up, to steep in jars in her cellar. The flesh was cool and soft as a belly. She couldn't stop. It's not about trespassing, the next letter said. I don't own these Nervines any more than you, but I'm here to protect them. I am trying not to hate you. She emerged and headed back toward the distant porch light of her home. These nights she turned it off, but employed her motion sensor strobe. It had been triggering a lot lately, so much that it was scaring her. She shouldn't be scared, she told herself. There were animals that wandered into her unfenced yard all the time. Just some deer, coyote, some masked raccoons. But there were train tracks not far away, and it was important to have some sort of security measure, even just a mock-up. But she still shut her eyes hard against it. End of the next letter. Rilke wrote, For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Off to the right, west, in the direction of the mountain, there was a shape in the grass, round and low and dark. The moon was growing bright, bolder, pushing through the clouds like a wallet so empty it sang. The shape spoke. So, you can't stop. No, I can't, she said to it. I know you know what that's like. A dog bayed from a distant run. Are you going to hurt me now? The silence. The white hot grass. Monotropa uniflora, or ghost pipe, is a waxy white plant that can appear pale pink or speckled with black. Ghost pipe prefers dark, shady woods with beds of decaying organic matter. A known nervine, an ally and a balm of the nervous system, it resembles visually a spine and a brain stem. An atypical analgesic, it doesn't deaden our pain, which serves a purpose, but rather puts us beside it, pulls us separate from it, and provides some measure of space. Ghost pipe is a coveted seductive and irresistible to many, though due to its rarity, and important role in an ecosystem, its harvest is frequently disparaged. As a parasite feeding on a parasite, and without its own photosynthesis, the herbaceous perennial is a ghost-like healer for ailments like ophthalmological inflammation and overwhelming emotional wounds. You know, weirdly enough, at this motel where I stayed the night, there's a little sort of um, borrower's bookshelf. You know, you can go over and, and oh, there's about 60 or 70 paperbacks, you know, if, in case the guests are bored. But one of the things I, I happen to notice is uh, facts about, uh, just strange facts. And I was flipping through it. I came across something about how uh, the world record for the fastest growing plant it's a, a certain species of bamboo, which actually can grow up to three feet per day. And, and which means, I suppose, that if you were to just stand and watch this bamboo and lean in close, you can see it moving and growing. I find that kind of 
kind of chilling for some reason. It, it's like we're not so it's we're, we're just not supposed to see that, and the very fact that we can in this one in, in this species of bamboo that that I don't know. It's kind of a it's kind of a kind of an eerie eerie thought to me. Yes, I remember having a little Venus flytrap plant when I was when I was a kid. I don't know that those move fast enough for us to detect with our eye. It still is faster than than, than is comfortable. Um, and you know they're always uh, filmed with you know time lapse, uh, but I don't think as dramatic as um, as other natural processes. Yeah, there are there are some wild plants. Um, there's a particular uh, cactus. It sits low to the ground, so it's basically kind of sitting on the ground, and it looks like a brain. So there, <laughs> it will just, it appears as if there's just a spiky brain just setting on the ground. It's quite alarming. Uh, there's other things that I love. Some of the, um, you know, some of the fungus are, there's one called bleeding tooth, which is just uh, hair raising. It, it has this appearance as if it's, it's um, there are these great kind of beads and bubbles of blood emerging from uh, kind of pores in it. Um, there's some, there's some uh, quite frightening looking plants out there. Yeah, I remember I was in a, at an arboretum once. I'll never forget the name of this plant, kind of an innocuous plant. I think it was a creeper. Uh, it was called Dragon's Blood Sedum. Dragon's Blood Sedum. I'll never forget that. Uh, all this has gotten to me because I, I, I'm remembering uh, you know, my, my grandmother lived uh, on the tall grass prairie in Minnesota. Um, I spent two winters with her when I was a child. She lived in a, uh, a trailer out on, out, on the, out on the prairie. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced before, but she lived on the, on the, on the, the edge of a field of, of just those, those waving tall grasses that when the wind kicked up and it seemed like the wind was always kicking up, um, it just creates weird, snaking, mysterious patterns in the grass all day and all night. And I would watch them, and, and I was frightened of of that grass. It was all higher than I was, it felt like. Uh, and it just seemed to be surrounding the place where she lived. And there were times I'd lie in bed at night, and I, I could hear it outside my window, and I was tempted to... to to go to my grandmother's bedroom and knock and say, you know, can I, can I sleep in the in the little bed uh, near hers? I never did. And um, oh, she lived to be a uh, ninety eight, and I I went back there for the funeral. I hadn't been back there for thirty years. Went back for the funeral and um, actually stayed the night in that little trailer was still there where she'd still been living and I woke up in the middle of the night and I don't know if I was sort of caught between sleep and waking or if I it was actually a nightmare uh, but the grasses those tall waving grasses that surrounded where she lived they were beating against my window beating like uh, thousands of little tiny hands I I, I couldn't see the grass, but I heard it, and it had never been that close to the trailer before. Uh, and when I woke up in the morning, you know, everything was completely normal. I looked out, and there it was, as if you know, time had not passed. It had been so long since I lived there, but the grass was swaying in the wind. And I thought, what, what was that? What happened last night? What, what was that? Is it real? So I suppose I just have these these images in in my memory, and I've I, I think that when uh, 
when the tendrils of that plant closed around me uh, here in Minden, it it just just brought a lot of things back. Toward a biography of the spider orchid and a human psychology. To be followed by an old folk tale. Dr. Leslie Hogue, 1958. The spider orchid appears much as it sounds. It has long, spidery sepals, does not do well in full sun, lips have a marginal fringe. Some varieties present as more literal than others. So much do they resemble marching or staring spiders, or spiders suspended in air, that no imagination is involved and none needs to be employed. There are all kinds and all manner of names for all kinds, and some distinct groups. Dragon, hair, fairy, pink fingers, wispy, zebra, cowslip. Margins fringed with short to long teeth. Caledonia or Arachnorchus. Brassia, Cymbidiae, Oncidianae, Orchidaceae, Epidendroidae, should not be allowed to dry out. Found in rainforests, but also in Peru, in the folded Andes, Andes magnificent, Andes superlative, Andes volcanic. Filamentous roots or simply just rootless. Solitary leaf and an unbranched stem. Spider is a kind of epiphyte or air plant, not parasitic, but grows upon another plant or object merely for support. No attachment to the ground or any other nutrient source. Grows best when hanging. That said, it is also suggested to incorporate a small amount of blood and bone fertilizer in a potting mix. While repotting is contradictory, they need a change of medium from time to time. Best ratio for fertilizer, 20-20-20. To propagate, You'll need to consider mimicking the tropical conditions in which they grow. They are not tolerant of frost, but propagation is complicated. They can be propagated by dividing the pseudobulbs at the base of the plants, but really, pollinator attraction is based on sexual deception of male thinned wasps. The female of this breed is wingless. In this event, the wasp is a fool. It mistakes this flower for an insect and stings it. Now stuck, trapped like a meal, it must attempt, if it wishes to prolong its short life, to rest itself away. There is the story of a girl who lived in a tree. She loved it there the big branches and the wide, flat leaves of its green hair. She felt protected up there, from below and from above, from the wind and the soil filled with graves. But she wouldn't realize this until much, much later, when she paid a lot of money to tell someone those things. And then she didn't live in the tree anymore, and she often didn't know where to go. But she climbed the pipes in the alleys of her city, up to the roofs where she could see the light spread across the land like eggs. And she called out lowly to those who might be like her, who might hear her tap and purr, and waited in her silk arcade until she couldn't anymore.
there's a film that I watched recently. It was a film from uh, 1974. It had uh, Jason Robards and Sandy Dennis and Gene Simmons. It's about this man and wife. They just, you know, live in a, a friendly spot, you know. He starts to long for, you know, some kind of a richer life. Like he is um, particularly stopping to the trees and talking to them. And, you know, you just get the feeling that he, you know, he loves the outdoors. And, you know, he seems to be struggling with a way to commune with, with, with nature and be more, I guess, live more elementally. And so, you know, we see him go home and interact with his wife, and he mentions this uh, tale from Greek mythology, right? The tale, it's, it's the tale of Bossis and Philemon. They, the, this couple, expressed to Zeus that they would now like to, their one wish is to be able to be together at the, time of at at their time of death like they want to die at the same moment and so Zeus grants their wish and he uh, turns them into an intertwining pair of trees and so he shares this vision with her he actually says I want to be I want to be a tree I want to he keeps using this word I want to metamorphosize into a tree at, at, at night, he goes out to their small backyard and um, he digs a little hole and he takes off his shoes and socks and he stands in, in the hole. And he, you know, doesn't know really what to do or how this is going to happen, but he stands up, he stands erect, and he just passes the nights that way. He repeatedly asks his wife to join him because that's what he wants. Oh my, that that reminds me of of the Michael Golliser case. Uh, One of the more regrettable things I've investigated. Michael Golliser was a lumberjack uh, and he killed his family in uh, Alberta, Canada. Oh, just a a sad case, but the, the, the strangest thing was that, uh, he was sometimes called the tree demon in the press simply because after he did this horrible thing and he had been acting very strange for weeks, he had been, been telling his friends, his family uh, about his job and his stresses in his job, saying things like, it's just impossible. It's impossible. It can't be done. They didn't know what he was talking about. And one night he killed his, his wife and his, his son and his daughter. And uh, he left the house and through chance, a uh, closed circuit security camera at, at, the, at the strip mall a mile from his house saw what he did then, grainy black and white, but a good angle regardless. I saw the footage. Uh, Michael Golliser, he walked to the strip mall and he walked to the edge of it, uh, and behind it there were trees where the small forest began. And you can see him on the camera. He's going he walks into the first rank of trees and he goes to one and he starts whispering to it. And there's no sound in the video, of course. And then he moves to another one. He whispers something and he moves to another and he whispers to it again and again. And he's moving among the first rank of trees with just a, just in the, in the dim ambient glow of a nearby street light is how you see this. And he seems to be talking to them for about 20 minutes and then he just stands there between two trees as if he were one of them almost looking out. And uh, he's there for about two hours. And then he turns and he goes deeper into the woods. And that is the last anyone ever saw him. He's never been found. But they did find uh, back at his house the last thing he he wrote. He wrote it uh, on the back of a of the receipts of the pizza the family had ordered for dinner that night. He wrote big, strange, almost clownish letters. What are we going to do about all the trees?
he finally had a garden space. Or rather, it was there before, but he'd finally primed the patch. Mostly himself, but he surely employed the advice of a friend. She spent some long afternoons with him, removing twigs and little yellow weeds strung through crumbling baseballs of dry soil, and helped him clear them and smash them open to make a bed. He had fallen in love with pictures of a beautiful black grass and longed to line the kidney-shaped countries of his backyard with it as a nod to dark hope, a canvas for brighter things. It was evergreen, a word he loved. It conjured up snows and nights so quiet you could hear the motion of your breathing shift your ear on a cool pillow. He planted it in spring, and he liked what it made him think of. His mind went to color, to roundness, to contrast with the licorice razors of the leaves. He started finding hacked portions of raw meat buried in the pitch-colored grass, as if they had fallen from the sky, or, more possibly, been thrown into it over the fence. He picked them up in the galvanized scoop of his shovel. They were garnet turning to gray from air, coagulated, and he genuinely couldn't identify them. They smelled like old blood and silvery coin. This changed what he ate and how much he slept at night. One day when he was working, a man appeared at the fence to the alley. He didn't notice right away, but as he rose from his knees and began to stretch back, he saw the shoulders and face in the afternoon sun. He wondered how long the man had been standing there, for he had been talking to himself embarrassingly, wandering the lines of an old book from childhood. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows, and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows, and no birds ever sing excepting old crows. Hello, hello, the man said. Hello, he replied. The man looked cherubic and shiny with a fixed smile. He was wearing some sort of striped collared polo shirt with wide bands of primary color, crayon color, like something a boy would wear. I've been watching your black Mondo. Really, he said. He thought of the meat, the tendons on bone. Do you live around here? Oh, no, the man said. I made a special trip. He moved a step back from the fence and looked both ways down the alley. Noting his puzzlement, his lack of answer, the man added, My brother lives nearby. I help him sometimes. He's sick. He busied himself gathering tools, the man still beaming, now looking around and up at the trees and moving closer and placing his fingers on top of the fence. You need to feed it special food, he said. It's always hungry. Most people don't know. Oh, I'm... He shakily took up a few of the tools and headed inside. Nervously, in auto motion, he repeated the storybook words like a prayer. You won't see the onceler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. Black Mondo grass is actually not a grass at all, but its leaves are long and spiky and thin as squid and clinguini. Black Mondo grass has few pest or disease issues, but smut may be a problem unless the plant's leaves have time to dry before night. Slugs occasionally are an issue. Otherwise, grass care is easy and low maintenance. The best way to propagate this plant is through division. As the plant matures, 
usually in a couple of years. It will send out rhizomes that will form little baby plants. Divide these away from the parent in spring. 